Hello there, Office Hours listeners. Another day, another episode, and today's guest is Mr. William Clark. Now, William Clark was an American explorer, soldier, <laughs> Indian agent, and a territorial governor, a native of Virginia. Wait, wait, that doesn't sound right. That was my friend with uh, Meriwether Lewis, yeah. Oh, so. oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, okay, I, I prepared another one because I really wasn't sure. So, William uh, Andrews Clark was an American politician, an entrepreneur, involved with mining, banking, railroads, born in Pelsen. Is that, that That's another William Clark, yeah. There's, oh. there's lots of us. Oh, well, I think I got the greatest one here. I think, I, because, Professor, I don't think any of these William Clarks drove a bike to Burgas, <laughs> drove a bike to Okhrit, I don't think any of those guys have had basically every single AVG student since 2007 yeah. pass through them because they teach the um, science courses in AVG. I think I think this William Clark is pretty great. Okay, thank I, you. I'm not impressed by these other William <laughs> Clarks. Nothing special. How are we feeling? <laughs> Welcome Good. to the show. Thank I'm you. I'm very happy to have you here. I'm looking forward to our talks. And... I, I, and I bet that the listeners now are like, what? He rode a bike to Burgas? Is that not a joke? You know, like people say, oh, what, am I going to ride a bike there? And you really did. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about how that happened. Well, uh, I've, I've always been active. I like, you know, I used to run a lot. Uh, biking is easier on the body than uh, running. So, you know, I mm. got older and did more biking. And when I turned 60, I thought, you know, I, I got to do something special. 60. So, um I, I kind of mapped out a route across the country trying to avoid all the main roads and you know, take as many back roads as possible and just... Isn't it harder on back roads, though? Yeah, I mean, the, the roads are steeper and rockier and stuff, but it's, it's far more interesting. So I, I wasn't trying to set any records. I just wanted to, to get there. Oh, yeah, because that's not a record or anything. Just just wanted to get there. I mean, there's, there's people who will bike that much in, in you know, half a day, I mean, mm. road racers, but I'm, you know, I, I have to realize I'm, I'm a 60-something-year-old now and just slow and steady, but it was, it was beautiful. And to think that you did that when you were 60, that's incredible. Meanwhile, I get tired from walking up the stairs in the canteen. <laughs> Professor, how, have you been a sports person your entire life that led you up to being able to ride well, a bike? Well, yeah, well, just, just being active, so, you know, just exercise is part of my life, you know, I, I come to campus either on my bike or I walk. I live about uh, two kilometers away, so mm -hmm. I get a little exercise every day doing that. And then in the warmer weather, I go on longer rides when I have time, you know, when I don't have to teach classes. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the uh, winter, I do um, you know, uh, cross-country skiing, al alpine touring skiing. So I just mm -hmm. there's just something about my psyche. I, I have to keep active or I, I, I feel like I've wasted the day. Nice, nice. What about when you don't have motivation to just go and be active? Or it must be? Um, well, you know, there was a... I was, um, I was sick for about a year, a little over a year ago, and part of the, I, I was nauseous and just had this fatigue, and it, it was crazy because I, I just wanted to be active. Uh, so I, I, I'm usually very motivated to do something, but what, what's hard is when I want to do something and I can't either because I don't have the time or, or in that last case, because I was sick. So... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I, when I was a more serious runner, there were times when you know you look outside and it's raining and cold, and you realize you have to do it anyhow. You just you, know, you just do it. Mm -hmm. Now, professor, tell us about how you came to UBG. The story about how you became a professor here at UBG. Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. My wife and I, with our two kids, moved to Sofia in 1992. We were working with a Christian organization. Uh, we did some different humanitarian work and helped with uh, adoptions, did things at um, orphanages. And somewhere along there, I think it was about 1996, uh, we got a, a knock on our door, and uh, there was an AUBG student there. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how they found out about us or knew about us, but he said, um, no, we understand that you're kind of a, some kind of Christian or something, and you work with this um, org organization. He said, there's a group of us at AUBG who are reading the Bible together, and would you and your wife be willing to come down and you know, just help us, to, you know, maybe give some leadership? And so uh, we started coming down here twice a month uh, during the school year, and I think it was the first time was 1997, 
And then, we, you know, we continued that uh, for a few years, and we just fell in love with the place. Mm. We thought, oh, these students are so wonderful. Uh, you know, they're, they're bright and intelligent. Plus, they all speak English. <laughs> you know, we, we were struggling with uh, doing things in Bulgarian. Uh, and we were thinking, how could we become a part of this? You know, how could we, um, you know, be better connected to what's happening at AUBG? And I was thinking, well, the, probably the best way would be to become a professor, but I was 45 years old at the time, and I was thinking, no, how, I can't go back to school now. I've been out of school for, you know, 25 years or whatever. And somebody said, well, why not? You know, if, if you think you ought to do it, just just do it. So in 2000, we were going back to the States anyhow because our kids were finishing high school, starting college, and we wanted to help them with the transition. And we had a house uh, in State College, Pennsylvania, which is the home of uh, Penn State University. Mm-hmm. And so I just applied and thinking, you know, maybe I'll be accepted. And I got accepted. I got a full you know, scholarship stipend. Didn't, in fact, they gave me money to be a student, mm-hmm. finished my master's degree, and um, figured, well, might as well get a Ph.D. as long as you're willing to pay for it. And I loved being a student, so I got, got the Ph.D. As soon as I finished the Ph.D., we came back to Bulgaria. It took, um, we came back in 2005. I taught at Yuzu, the other mm-hmm. university in town, for two years, and then uh, a job opened up at AUBG. So here I am. Mm-hmm. That's very nice. So the entire time you had the intention of of coming back here. Yeah, the whole purpose of getting the PhD was so I could teach at AUBG. Wow. Yeah. So that wish came true for you. Would yeah. you say it was destiny or it was just you who wanted to get it and got yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, what, what's destiny? I, I don't know. That, um, you don't believe in destiny? Well... I, I think there's purpose to the universe and that there's a God who has, uh, you know, uh, intentions. Mm-hmm. But I also believe that, you know, we have to do mm-hmm. our work. You know, I, you can't just wish for something to happen. You know, so you do the best you can to figure out what you should be doing, and then you take the steps to get there. So there, there were a lot of hurdles I had to, you know, jump to, to get the Ph.D. and all, um, you know, especially when you're what they call a non-traditional student. I was older than you know, some of my teachers, mm-hmm. but, you know, that, that was fine. But yeah, it was um, my purpose, and, and, and we thought that this is the place we ought to be because we thought we had something we could offer to students. And being a professor just gave us, you know, and, and my wife works at the writing center, so it just gave us an insider type relationship to the university rather than being somebody in the community trying to connect with students. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned um, that those students said, oh, you're a part of this Christian thing. Can you tell us more about what that Christian thing was? What exactly you were doing in this organization? Well, um, most of what we were, we were trying to connect with uh, university students because for um, 20, let me see, starting in 1981 until 92. So uh, for 10 years in the States, we were working on the campus as a campus chaplain. In, in the United States, almost every campus has a um, you know set of chaplains that provide... Know, spiritual guidance for students. And so we, we had things like mm-hmm. Bible studies and all. And we thought, well, we'd like to do this in, in Bulgaria because it was right after uh, the changes, as they call them. Mm-hmm. Uh, most Bulgarians didn't have access to, you know, had never picked up a Bible, had never been to church. And so we thought we'd come here and meet with students. But as you know, uh, universities in Bulgaria are quite different. Uh, the, the students were spread all over the city. There were no dorms. Um, most students never went to classes. Uh, mm-hmm. So we, we were just meeting lots of young people. We did different initiatives. We organized uh, you know, some hikes and organized um, different projects. We got involved in helping uh, pensioners pay their heating bills, and then we found there was need at orphanages. So we just we we're just trying to find ways to be useful. So it was nice when it came to AUBG, we could be more focused on just you know, spending time with students. Mm-hmm. And, and getting to know students. And plus, I, I love teaching. So teaching was wonderful and is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned when we were talking before even recording that you grew up Christian, mm-hmm. right? And obviously you've been involved in Christian organizations. And I'm just sort of wondering how has Christianity shaped your life? And um, maybe tell me something more about your beliefs and how it has guided you through life. And why do you think that um, Christianity is important? Yeah, well, if um, 
you know, one of the big questions, you know, does God exist? So if there is a God, I mean, if there's no God, then Christianity means nothing. Exactly. But if God does exist, um, and if there is a way to know him, that seems like that would be something really valuable. So because of my background that I grew up in, and then you, you go off to college and you kind of question your beliefs and you're exposed to all different ideas, and so I had to kind of reevaluate uh, you know, I reevaluated what I believe, um, saw that there was a good, solid, uh, you know, logical reasons, philosophical reasons, archaeological, you know, scientific. There's good reasons for what I believe. So knowing God is, uh, you know, changes your life. Uh, if, if life is, if there is no God, then life, not that life has no purpose, but it has no specific direction. But if there is a God and there's a way to know him, now, then, then life has a purpose and direction. So that's that's why it's important. It, it gives me a you know, purpose, direction. Uh, it gives me guidelines on you know, what does it mean to um, to live a, a life that has meaning. You know, mm-hmm. all, all these things. Life, love thy neighbor as yeah. You know. And then just you know, how do we treat other people? Uh, love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. How do we treat the environment? You know, we were um, placed on earth to be caretakers of the world. Uh, so all, all these things. Yeah. Caretakers of the world and instead look at where we are today. Yeah, not everyone has that view. A lot of people, you know, mm-hmm. but let's get as much from the earth as we can without giving much back. Professor, because you teach environmental science and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but you had a degree in environmental science or something like that. Yeah, and my, you wildlife biology? Yeah, my, my undergraduate degree was uh, in wildlife biology. Mm-hmm. And you're passionate about environmental science, right? Yeah, I mean, just I, I love the outdoors. I love nature. Um, I want to see the world taken care of, you know, the natural world mm-hmm. taken care of. How do we become better caretakers of this beautiful nature? What would you tell us, everybody who's listening and watching? What should we do? Um, well, I think that you know, for those of us in, in the West, and I know a lot of Bulgarians think, oh, no, we're not really the West, but you are. You know, you're, 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 this is Europe, um, one of the richer parts of the world, I, I would say the first thing is we just have to stop consuming so much. You know, mm-hmm. just, just simplify our lives. Um, you know, we, we don't have to, you know, have a lot of material things. Uh, we, we can simplify our lives. We don't have to drive as much. Uh, you know, we don't have to eat as much meat. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to just make our footprint considerably smaller. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest problem with this is because it entails a lifestyle change. And you know how hard it is for people to change their lifestyle and their habits. For example, my mom, for the first time, she would be like, well, where am I going to throw garbage if I don't use plastic? Well, Mm -hmm. how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? I have to drive to work. I can't walk to work. How would you encourage us? What what should be the motivation? Because there should be a strong motivation for us. We don't think it, it makes that much of an impact, but it does, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I mean... The, on the one hand, your mother's right. The small things don't make a huge difference individually. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not going to tackle climate change, but there, it, it's the mindset that's important. And then the big things will, will happen because of legislation and uh, you know uh, things like you know, the Paris uh, Accords and all that. But that happens when individual people value it. You know, if individual people don't value it, then legislators aren't motivated to make, you know, they, they have to be pushed. And they have to be pushed by people who say, we need to change the way we're, we're treating the planet. So it does start with individuals. But, you know, whether I turn off the tap when I brush my teeth or not isn't going to, you know, mm-hmm. even, even if a million people do it, it doesn't make that big a difference. But if everyone thinks that way, then they're going to demand that their mm-hmm. societies act differently. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that us caring about it would make us more active into spreading that message to people who actually are in power and who take those steps. Right. And, and why, why would people care about it? Well, a lot of people are just oblivious. So first of all, you, you have to be informed. And then, you know, uh, it has to be part of your, your kind of um, worldview. So you know, as, a, uh, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, because I, I, I view it's uh, treating the earth is important, also treating others uh, well is important. I had to be thinking about how do my actions directly or indirectly impact the poor, say, in Africa? 
You know, the climate change that's generated primarily by the United States and now, you know, China and, and, and Europe and all, that's, um, we're not really feeling the worst impact of that. The worst impact of that is being felt in the poorer countries of the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can say, well, that's tough. You know, they shouldn't have been born there, but you know, I, I can't mm-hmm. because they're our fellow human beings. Do you feel optimistic about the future of the environment? I mean, environmental science or sustainability? Or um, I, I tend to be an optimist just by nature. Uh, but like I, I tell my students, I'm, how old am I now? I'm 67 now, so I'm going to be fine. Uh, you know, even if I live another 30 years, I don't think in 30 years it's going to be terrible. But uh, for my kids... And for you know, your students, and especially for your, your children, the world's going to be a vastly different place, and, and not a better place, unless we tackle some of these big problems. So um, I didn't answer your question. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm... No, you did. You said you were an optimist. Yeah, I, I'm somewhat optimistic that we can do this. I'm not sure if people have felt enough pain from climate change yet where they feel the urgency. Mm. This is the problem, because it seems like a problem that would happen... In, in 70 years. Yeah, and because, years. It, and because it requires um, you know, political solutions, not just individuals acting, politicians are in office, no, unless you're Putin, but you know, politicians are in office just for you know, a few years, and so they're thinking, why should I sacrifice the economy during my term of office for a benefit that I'm not even sure will happen? Mm-hmm. So it's really hard for politicians to think think in the future about you know, things like climate change and ocean pollution and all these things. Mm. I'm not a political scientist. That's just my, <laughs> uh, no, my, my personal opinion. Unfortunately, they're intertwined. Unfortunately. Yeah, right. um, now, you mentioned, you mentioned, this is, I'm going back to the Christianity. I'm sorry I'm putting such an emphasis on this, but you mentioned a follower of Jesus. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, um, the word Christian especially in the United States, it's kind of a loaded term now. It's, it's been tied yes. up with politics and everything. And, and really the word Christian does, all it means is a follower of Jesus. So um, you know, people sometimes ask me, you know, what kind of Christian are you? And I, and I try to say, you know, I want to be a good Christian, but um, you know, they, they want to know, are you Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic, mm-hmm. or whatever? And so I usually tell them that I'm a historical Orthodox Christian. Not Eastern Orthodox, but... Uh, I think what I believe and follow is what Christians have believed and followed for the last 2,000 years. And, mm-hmm. and so going back to the original scriptures, going back to the apostles, the you know, um, historical Christianity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so to avoid confusion, when, when people listen to that loaded word Christian, I, you know, if I say I'm a follower of Jesus, it usually makes them ask, ask a follow-up question, what do you mean? Mm. So. And I did that. Yeah, yeah, yes. see, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your values and principles as a follower of Jesus, the same as the apostles? Well, um, you know, life is about, um, not about myself, but it's, it's, am I relating to God the way that he wants me to? Do I relate to other people the way God wants me to? So it's, it should be uh, theocentric, meaning that God should be at the center mm-hmm. of it. So I, I try to live a life that's not, me centered, mm-hmm. but that's God centered and others centered, and then as a result, I I, I think my life is is better because of that. So mm-hmm. in a way, uh, you know, it's it's actually the best benefit for me is to live in harmony with the way that God wants people to live. Mm. Now this this thing that you said reminded me of uh, your TED talk, TEDx talk, mm-hmm. which was an egocentric altruist. Right? Yeah. And there you talk about how we should focus our energy outward, about how we affect other people and our environment rather than inward. And I, th- I think that's beautiful. We should, we should incorporate more of that mindset. It's, it's really hard for us to break out of that because it's just so natural for us to look out for ourselves. And it's, it's not bad. Of course we have to look out for ourselves, but we get stuck there and we forget that we share the planet with uh, 8 billion other people. Mm. Could you... Okay, because I don't think the now I'm a bad interviewer for my audience because maybe my audience doesn't know about your TEDx talk. Could you maybe bring something to it? Your TEDx talk, 
give us the main ideas about being egocentric and being an egocentric altruist and why it is important. Yeah, so uh, the, the TED Talk, that, that was a while ago. Um, 2017. 2017, yeah, it seems pre-COVID, you know, a whole yeah. different world. But <laughs> the whole idea of just um, having um, an other's mindset that, uh, you know, a simple example is, uh, and, and I find this happens all the time, you're walking down the sidewalk, and, you know, the sidewalks have people coming and going, and I wonder, you know, why is it that if I, if I just kind of walk straight and I say to the edge of the sidewalk, people would bump into me. I have to move. Mm-hmm. And it's not, because they're, um, it's not because they're aggressive or, um, you know, want to be mean. It's just that they're so absorbed in wanting to get to where they want to go that they forget that, you know, I, I have to kind of share the sidewalk with other people. Um, we both, you know, and ideally we'd both, you know, move aside a little bit. Um, and then... You know, I, I don't want to step on any toes here, but the way Bulgarians drive sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, there's other people on the road. And if we all would just take care of each other, the traffic would move faster, everyone would be happier, we would have fewer accidents, uh, you know, you'd get home and you wouldn't be, you know, your, your blood pressure would be normal. But, you know, everyone's kind of looking out for themselves. How can I get to where I want to go? And why are all these other people on the road getting in my way? And just so that the idea of my talk was, we just have to start thinking in terms of, you know, other people are out there, they have feelings, they have goals, they have desires. Um, and just being aware of that uh, sometimes can, can help us to behave in a, a different way. Mm. But then again, why should we make the sacrifice? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I could live that way. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a part of me that wants me first. I have to fight with it all the time. But when I do that, I don't find myself any happier. I, I actually find myself feeling more fulfilled when, uh, when I can bring value to other people's lives. Yeah. And I remember you said that even um, altruism or doing good for others, it has its selfish reasons because it is to make us feel better. But again, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly, you know, motivations are really slippery things, you know. It's hard to know if my mo- motives are pure or mixed, but mm-hmm. uh, so I, I hope that I just don't do things to help others so that I feel better. But I think it's a, a natural byproduct, result. Maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. a natural, favorable byproduct that, mm-hmm. you know, when I help others, then I feel good. You know, mm-hmm. I come home at the end of the day, like, yeah, you know, I, I help some students, you know, and I feel good. You know, a student came to my office and I helped them work through a, mm-hmm. a hard concept. And, you know, I, I, I could have come home earlier and that would have been nice. But the fact that I was able to help someone, you know, I, makes me feel good. Aww. Do you feel like that every day after classes? Or uh, after, only after office hours? Only after somebody has a concept no, I, to be cleared? <laughs> Most of the time, I, I, I feel good after teaching. I when, when I, uh, I I don't I don't have a tendency towards depression, but when I feel um, you know sliding towards that uh, is, is when I feel like I haven't done anything worthwhile. So if I'm just sitting in my office studying by myself, and, and I and I love to you know I love learning new things, I just feel kind of empty at the end of the day. But if I've engaged with people, and I, and I'm I'm not an extrovert, um, I, I'm an introvert. But if I don't engage with people uh, meaningfully, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like you know, I, I'm not doing what I'm sp- supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. What is it that you love about teaching so much? Well, I, I, I love being a student myself. So, uh, so when I first came here, um, they wanted someone to teach biology. And, and I, I have taken lots of biology courses, so it isn't like I was completely um, you know, clueless. <laughs> but you know, I, I had studied basic biology for a long time so what was really fun was just having to you know learn everything uh, again and then think about how do I present this and then just seeing other people get excited about it you know that that w- when you see other people getting excited about uh, you know the intricacies of um, you know nature of cells or whatever it's 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 rewarding to me mm-hmm. now biology is not the the first thing that you weren't really I don't want to say competent, but it wasn't your uh, sphere of expertise, and you had to teach it. Uh, it was also international a lot. You oh, ago, yeah, wasn't yeah. It? <laughs> so <laughs> why don't you tell us that story? So when I first came here, you no, know, I, I the, well, 
I thought I'd have a job right away at AUBG because the previous president said, no, if you get a degree, uh, you know, we, we we're going to have this big environmental program, you know, you'll be needed. And of course, uh, if you know anything about the history of AUBG, you know, we were changing presidents every, what, 18 months to two years. So that president was gone by the time I finished my PhD. <laughs> uh, so there was an opportunity at uh, Yuzu. I had a friend who knew the rector there, and um, so he said, oh, yeah, um, I've got, I got a job. I need an American. I need a native speaker to teach uh, my faculty English. So I, I started by teaching a group of 12 um, professors at Yuzu mm -hmm. English, and, and that was wonderful. Um, and he, because he had a big grant, he got the grant before he had a person to fulfill it. No, he, so he, um, and I don't know how much that money went to him and how much, no, I got paid and everything, so it was fine. <laughs> and then he said, okay, uh, this is great because uh, we have a, we have some master's level students coming from Lithuania to study international law on, on the Erasmus program. And we told them that we have classes in English, but we, we don't. don't. <laughs> so, um, I need you to teach a class on international law for these students. And I, and I said, well, I, I don't know anything about international law. I said, don't worry. You can get something on Wikipedia. And, you know, as long as it's in English uh, and, and you, you know, have the class, that's great. So I, every night I was up to like 2 in the morning studying stuff. And, and I, I, I found a compromise. I, I didn't teach straight up international law because I, I really know nothing about it. It's very complex. But I did teach a, a series of lectures on international environmental conventions. Mm, that's so, smart. so, you know, the uh, cities treaty and the uh, wetlands treaty and all these things. So, and, and the students liked it. They just wanted something in English and it worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I was very happy when finally at AUBG, you know, they wanted someone in the science department because I thought, okay, AUBG, I understand the system and, you know, things were much more organized here. Yeah, but, you know, if they're missing a faculty from the economics department, you may fill in as well. Well, yeah, it, there's a lot of faculty. In fact, I'd say most faculty are not necessarily teaching in their narrow er er area of expertise. Mm. But... The fact that, now, not that I could teach economics, but the fact that you get a PhD, what it says is you've learned how to learn. So a lot of the faculty um, are teaching their broad area of knowledge, but they've, they've had to you know, learn, they have to dig in and study and learn so that they can teach this, this narrow topic that they might be presenting. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned English speaking, and then earlier on you mentioned that it was hard doing work in Bulgarian. Do you know Bulgarian? Da. Da? Okay, better stop now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we um I mean we we have friends in town and neighbors and uh, I can sit down with someone and have a hour long, you know, conversation with them in Bulgarian. Wow. I've I've even preached at our church in Bulgarian. It's Malko Smeshno, but um, <laughs> You know, I, I get by and people understand it. And, yeah. I think it's even cuter for people when they realize that an American Yeah, cuter. Speak. See, I, <laughs> I, I've had students say that. No, um, at Yuzu, I had one class I was team teaching with a hydrologist, which is actually my area. And he said, okay, um, Bill, I, I want you to uh, just teach them in English because they all know English and they'll, they'll be fine. So I started teaching in English. They go, you know, Professor, we understand nothing. So I started teaching in um, Bulgarian a little bit, and, 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 and they just started laughing. So, oh, no go, no go, no go, Slatko. I, I love your accent. So, oh, okay, that wasn't what I was going for, but, you know. <laughs> okay, that's, that's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, you said Bill. Professor, I was so mind blown, because when I was preparing for my interview, it was stuck in my head, Bill Clark, Bill Clark. And yeah. in my document, I write Bill Clark. And then I go to the office, and I'm like, oh, my God, I wrote Bill Clark. His name is apparently William. Oh, my God, I, mis I, I mistook my yeah. name of my guest. And they're like, Bill is short for William. Yeah. I'm like, what? I, I, I don't know how. Uh, Bill from William. Yeah. It's just uh, the, the standard nickname for William. Some people go by William, but to me it just sounds Very really official. formal. Formal, yeah. 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 
Okay. Well, but but I, I'm Bill, but I'm not Billy. <laughs> you know, I have some <laughs> my, my, my Bulgarian friends because they always you know put the diminutive on there. Mm. So you know, I, yeah, Bilche. <laughs> I'd be called, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be called Billy, and it's like, okay, you know, if that's what they want to call me, that's fine. Okay, so Bill Clark, and then I and then I made the mental connection. Wait, there's I think Alyssa Clark here in the university, mm-hmm, yeah, and that's your yeah. wife, mm-hmm. right? And I want to hear the love story. I want to hear how you met. Okay, yeah, we. And let's start there. Yeah, we we've been married now for. 40, it'll be, let me see, this year. It'll be 44 years in May. 44. So you met when you were 23? No, no. Met, um... Oh, no, married when you were... Married when I was 23. We, we met in high school. Um, really? Uh, I was 17. She was 16. Uh, we were both on this United Nations team, you know, mm-hmm. this United Nations debate team. And I, I, I wasn't even sure who she was because I was kind of shy. You know, I knew she was one of the other members of the team. And we had this trip... Um, to Harvard, where where there was a competition, and we were on this trip together, and that's where we you know got to know each other. We fell in love and mm. you know, started dating, and uh, we we both decided that we didn't want to be married while we were students. You know, for a couple of reasons. One, you no, know, we really wanted to focus on you know, our studies. Plus, uh, we were both involved with a Christian organization during our college years, and wanted to kind of focus on that aspect of our lives. So, you know, we, we, we made this you know, kind of agreement that we, we won't get married while we're both students. But one week after she graduated, we got married. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we showed great restraint. Yeah. Um, wait, because there were so many things that I wanted to ask. Um, as an introvert, how did you approach her? How did you manage to get out of your shell and... Well, one on, this girl. Yeah, so one on one, I was fine, uh-huh. and, and she's also an introvert, so you know, it, it was we great. We just found each other. Yeah, and and it was easy to talk to each other, and you know, she, you know, she was beautiful. She still is. <laughs> yes, yeah. professor. That's what I wanted to say. When I was watching your TED talk, there was a, a frame of her in the audience, and I was like, wow, this woman is gorgeous. Yeah, she really is. Um, how did you know that she was the one? Well, you know, I didn't at first, but you know, my um, and, and maybe it was just my upbringing or the uh, era I lived in or my personality. But I dated very, very few women. And, but when, if if I if I was in a relationship, you know, I figured, well, why would someone want a relationship and, and think ahead of time? Well, you know, this probably won't last, and I'll just do this while I'm having fun. So, you know, very early on, I figured, well, you know, I'm, I'm serious about this. I, I you know, at 17, I wasn't planning on getting married right away, but it was just like, why why else would I be in a relationship other than for it to be long-term? Mm. And so as we got to know each other better, um, you know, over time, it became clear that we shared a lot of the same values, that we um, enjoyed one another's company, that our outlook on the uh, world was the same. She was also a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, um, you know, and, and she was you know, wanted to make that the uh, kind of focal point of our lives. So that that was good because if I had married someone else, you know, they wouldn't want to be dragged off to Bulgaria and you know, go, where? For what? <laughs> mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you told me that you've done everything together. You've moved back and forth. Yeah, I mean, we... And I know this works for some people. They're, they're married, but they, they live separately. And I know there's professors at AUBG who are uh, living apart from their wives. And and, and that's, that's fine. That's their decision, but... You know, uh, Lisa and I just to say, no, we're married. We're, you know, we're not going to live separately from each other. We're going to live together all the time. You know, and if I, if if she's called somewhere and you know, gets a job somewhere and we feel that's the right thing, then we'll go together. And then if I get a job somewhere, we'll go together. So that's so so sweet. And the reason why I'm asking this is because I don't know. In today's world, I'm afraid to say, but I don't. I don't believe in such. Um, such love anymore because you know today there are so many options in social media and everything and you keep thinking about other people and and that's just very sad well I, I think you know, love always exists and, and um, but relationships are hard work too and so the, you know, the question isn't just you know, with social media and all the options and things it's like are you willing to um, do the work and plus uh, you know, when we got married, we made a promise to each other that we would you know, live together for the rest of our lives. And we, we never even uh, considered that divorce 
could be an option. It just was off the table uh, because, and, and that's why, you know, it, we knew each other for, um, you know, six years before we got married or so, mm. five or six years. So I think sometimes it's just people um, enter into relationships with the idea that, well, if it doesn't work out, I can just get out of it, rather than saying, I'm going to get, if I'm going to give myself to this relationship, it's, 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 you know, for good. I, I'm not going to leave myself that escape, you know. Mm. That's an, a very important mindset shift because people in this university don't think Yeah, that I mean, way. not just this generation. It's, it's, it's the generation, right. yes. Yeah. What's the secret to a su uh, successful relationship? Or it's not a secret? I, 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 no, I, I don't know. I, I think people just have to, um, well, commitment and so you, you keep your commitments and, and, and there's I mean there's some situations where couples just have to separate it's abusive or something mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not saying people should stay together no matter what uh, there's you know, some people just you, you just got to get away from it but I, I think um, always being willing to forgive you know uh, not holding grudges uh, you know, there's, there's a verse in the Bible that says be angry but do not sin do not let the sun go down on your anger so just just a principle. Don't go to bed angry. You know, if if you've had a a fight during the day, resolve it. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as you can, rather than saying, you know, just I'm I'm going to be angry at you for the next week, and you know, we're not going to talk to each other. No, that that's just petty. You know, deal with it. Yeah, and there was this a very funny joke I came across uh, a while ago. It said me and my me and my husband said that we wouldn't go to bed angry and so we haven't slept since last <laughs> Thursday right right yeah yeah <laughs> okay anything else um and, and just you know we, we need to make allowances for one another's weaknesses this isn't just for marriage but any relationship you knows some people have strengths in one area some in the next other people have weaknesses so we uh we make allowances for one another's weaknesses and then um, build up one another in their strengths. So um, yeah. it's, 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 again, just that other's mindset that uh, when you enter into a relationship, especially marriage, we just have to realize at the beginning, it's not, it's not about me. Yes, yeah. it's not you versus me. It's me and you. Yeah, yeah. So that, and, and that was one of the hardest things when you get married is that you know, prior to that, you make decisions about how am I going to spend my money, how am I going to spend my time, now it's for me. me. Now it's like, how are we going to spend mm -hmm. our money? How are we going to spend our time? And, you know, there's two of us now. So. Yeah. And it's more beautiful that yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, 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 life has been good. Um, so you said you met her when you were high school sweethearts and then yeah. you were together in college. What were you like as a student? What was Bill back then? Oh, right? yeah. Was it a cool Bill? No, no, I, I, I've, <laughs> never been, I've never been accused of being cool. Um, <laughs> You are now. You are a cool person. Well, yeah. It, I give it to you. I'm, I'm not trying to be cool. Um, when I was a, a, a freshman at Syracuse, um, I was known as a mystery man on my floor. We, we had like 40 students on the floor. And, you know, like a freshman dorm, there's things going on in the hall all the time and interactions. But I would just kind of stick to myself. I, I, I wasn't on unfriendly terms with anyone. I, I had, you know, I got along with everyone on the floor and was friendly. But you know, I had no interest in going to parties and you know all all these things. So I, I would get up in the morning, go for my morning run, and go to class, and you know come back and maybe go for an uh, evening run, then hang out in the room doing studying. It's like he they call me the mystery man. Now, who who is who is this guy? We never see him. You know? <laughs> we know he's there. <laughs> yeah. So one could find you either uh, studying or running. Yeah, yeah, it. for the most part, yeah. And that's what made. 60-year-old Professor Clark being able to drive to Burgas. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I had wow. a good base, yeah. I'm still, I still can't get over that. Wow. Okay. Okay. So no parties. I mean, I, uh, I, don't, I don't mind. I guess there's some types of parties I like, but, um, you know, to be, I, I went to the, uh, the there's a, a Bulgarian singer, um, Vasco Kruptita. He was very famous <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> and he was in Blagovgrad once and played at the underground. That was my next question. I was literally 
thinking about how I want to ask you whether somebody has taken you to a Chalga club here in Blagojevgrad or <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. is the underground uh, Chalga no, club? No, no. Chalga so, club. but you know, I went to the underground and you know, to see him because you know we know each other and I like his music, and it's just and and this is um, before they had the smoking ban, I think. So mm-hmm. you know, it's filled with smoke, jam packed with people, yeah. super loud, and thought, wow, people do this for fun. <laughs> really? You know, I would rather take my bike and just go off by myself and, you know, enjoy nature and be quiet and get exercise. I mean, I, I enjoy people, but parties just don't, don't do it for me. I, I'm glad it does it for other people, but, uh, yeah, it's not my thing. Yeah, I get it. So no Chalga Club? Have no, you heard Chalga no. music? Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard about Chalga. <laughs> and, and they used to have the Chalga hair, you know, the um, they used to call it Chalga hair, the women hair. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> yeah, special. Yeah, yeah, I think the old Chalga singers had. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> so. Interesting. What kind of music are you into? Um, I, I like uh, you know, all sorts of music, but I, I really like um, American folk music, uh, acoustic. There uh, is such thing, American folk music? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, every country is has it folk country, music. Uh, is it country no, music? Not, not, not really country western. It's, it's a little different genre, but, um, you know, some... You know, some pop music's good, some country western music's good, but the uh, acoustic, you know, guitar, mm. um, you know, dulcimer, banjo, that type of stuff, bluegrass. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I think folk has a very different definition here on the well, Balkans. Well, yeah, it, it's it's folk music just means kind of the music of the of people. The people, yeah. Yeah, so it's 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 very different than Balkan folk music. Balkan it, folk it's music, it's yeah. very interesting, and and I, and I love it. But um, after you know. 10, 15 minutes, like, okay, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I need a little bit. <laughs> Let's move on, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we went through everything I wanted to ask you. Oh, okay. My last guest was Professor Harvey. Mm-hmm. And he told me that you did the karaoke improv. You won it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was that like? Congratulations. Maybe I'm 10 years late, but... <laughs> Um, when was it? How did it happen? Tell yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure when it was, but it was just, uh, it, it was really clever. And um, you know, Professor Harvey, I think one of his things is I- improv. Yeah. So he, he likes those things. So he uh, put together this thing where they would have a series of slides go up on the screen, and you had to give a lecture based on those slides without knowing what the, they were. And sometimes the slides, you know, like you'd have one slide and you'd say something about them, the next slide would come and it would be like, that's not related at all. But you had to kind of just seamlessly, mm-hmm. you know, keep keep going. So I, I think the key, you know, maybe, maybe the reason I, I was able to win that is that, um, and there's others that, you know, are really good, but you have to be willing to say, you know, it's okay if you make an idiot of yourself. Just, just do it, you know. Um, there, there's a thing that says, you know, if you want other people to bleed, you have to hemorrhage. So if you want the audience... To laugh, you just have to make a fool out of yourself. Just make a complete idiot of yourself. Don't worry about it. Just go for it. And and, and I, I guess they liked it. Yeah, and I think the the greater philosophy behind it is, no one really cares. It's it's yeah. not really about you. Right, right. Yeah. So if, um, if you can get freed from that preoccupation with self, which is something you know I fight with every day, because you know even even teaching, you know you're standing in front of your class, and I would like to say I just get lost in the teaching, and, and, and I do sometimes, but there's always in the back of your mind, you know, do the, do the students like me? You know, do, do they think I'm smart? You know, when they leave this class, are they going to tell other students, like, don't take you know, biology, it's really boring, and, and, and the professors you know. Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm at my best is when I'm not even thinking those things. So um, I think humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is just being free of not even... You know, I, I don't I have nothing to prove and nothing to lose. And then you can just be yourself and have fun. And hey, Professor, that's why I said you were cool, because you're just not trying to. You're just yourself and you're... Yeah. With the little jokes that you do in class, yeah, where you said the happy meter, like somebody's going to oh, say, yeah, yeah. oh, you're this happy today. <laughs> and that's the cool part of it, when you're not trying to. Just like with being funny, when you're not trying to be funny, you're funny. Yeah, so tied with that too, I, I've always been insecure. But the difference is, I'm now very secure about being insecure. Yeah. It's just like, I'm insecure, so what, you know? Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, but how do we get there? Oh, I'm, I'm insecure, but then let's just do yeah, it anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't want to get too theological and things, but to know that um, I'm accepted by God. I'm accepted by Him no matter what I do. Uh, you know, he, 
chooses to love me because it's he finds value in me, not because of who I am, but because it's it's who he is. He just loves people. And when you're loved by God, then you know it doesn't really matter what other people think. I mean, not that I want to go out of my way to you know be rude, but uh, that gives you that um, foundation where you can you know take risk with people because you know that even if I fail, you know, God still has a hold of me. I I love that. Now. You mentioned yesterday off record that you would be okay talking about the period when you were sick. Mm -hmm. And I I hate to bring you back to what must have been the toughest period of your life. But um, I just want to know, how did you find the strength to fight in that period? Yeah, I mean, it was... Um, so it all started with just... Um, I started feeling uh, nauseous and I had this terrible fatigue. Um, when it was at its worst, fortunately, you know, everything was online, so I would kind of, you know, drag myself to my, uh, you know, computer and, and give my lectures, and everything was online. And, In the pajamas. Um, yeah, well, no, I, I, I'd be <laughs> dressed and everything. And um, so we, this was in, uh, at the end of the spring 2021 semester. We, we have to go back to the States and see what's wrong, because I, I had all sorts of tests done here in Blagovgrad and saw different doctors and, you know, blood tests and... Uh, different scopes and things and uh, scans. Uh, so we went back to the States, and even there, we got there in, in May of 2021, and I didn't find out what the problem was until December of 2021. And uh, they finally, someone said, no, uh, we're just going to give you a, a brain MRI. You know, this looks like it could be something neurological. And they found there was a big tumor there. Mm. And in, in some ways, it was a relief because, you know... Um, and, you finally I, know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I know what's going on, and I like to joke with people. It turns out that all my symptoms were in my, were in my mind. Yeah. Literally. Literally, yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, my wife and I you know, talked to a surgeon, and it was in a... The, the tumor was in a very difficult place, and they said, we can do surgery, and um, here's the, you know, all the things that could go wrong. Yeah, oh, great. No, thanks for telling me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had no choice, and it... it, it turned out that I, I had a high school friend who's a um, neurologist now. You know, he and I were best friends in high school. He, um, we were both runners. And so he was able to direct me to a, a top-rate, world-class surgeon uh, that lived uh, near, near where I grew up. My sister still lives there, so I could stay with her to recover. And, um, you know, we, we, we asked lots of people to pray, so we had you know, hundreds of people praying for us. And... No, yeah, anxiety, but I, I didn't, my, my biggest concern was like, you know, if I, <laughs> if I die, you know, I thought, well, you know, that would be a, a bummer, but no, it won't be bad for me, but no, at least it's going to have to, you know, get along without me, so I, I was hoping not to die, you know, and uh, went into surgery, not super nervous, and I, and I think my wife was pretty calm, too, and, you know, the surgeon said, oh, you no, know, the, the tumor just peeled right off. No, everything's fine. Um, the recovery was a little rough. I was seeing double, and I couldn't walk. And, you know, I had to use a walker for you know, a few weeks. But um, by the, uh, let me see, that was in January of 2022. Um, you know, with, within a few months, I was on my bike again, and so I was all set. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So now I just have to go to the, um, I have to have an MRI done every um, three or four months just to, you know, make sure it hasn't come back. And mm. But, you know, you said, do I believe in destiny? Not so much destiny, but, you no, know, I believe that we live in a universe that, you know, there is a God, that he's in control, that uh, nothing can happen to me outside of his, his care and provision. So it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm guaranteed I, I'm going to live a long life now, but if I don't, no, that's okay because, mm -hmm. you know, what's 60 to 80 years is, pretty short compared to eternity <laughs> yeah was this belief uh your was this belief the reason why you you kept being optimistic were you optimistic during this period yeah i i think um part of it is just personality you know some people are optimists some people are, are pessimists so i think my uh, just my my personality plus my my faith you know i knew that uh you know, my biggest concern was like, okay, if I'm, you know, if I, if I survive the surgery, which I did, and everything went fine, no, I want to, I want to be able to do the things I enjoy, like skiing and, and biking. So I, I've been very happy 
uh, I, I had uh, two years where I wasn't out of my skis, and just last week I, I got out you know, skiing, and it was like, well, this is great. You know, life is good. Were you in Bansko? No, no, I, I, Bansko is, is just too crazy. It's um, yeah, too crowded. Too, it takes two hours to get up to the, you know to fight in the line. So um, I first went off on my alpine touring skis. I just drive up to the, you know you you fob, um, the river up to the end. Mm-hmm. Parked the car and then I just took my skis out and skied eight kilometers. You know, I have these climbing skis. <gasps> oh, so, those! Yeah. Wow. So that was great. I was all so by you myself. Really are a pro. And, yeah. And, well, nice. I'm, I, I, you know, I, I, I manage. I, I get through. And then uh, this week I went downhill skiing at a little place in uh, Osogovo mm-hmm. on the Macedonian border. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> Quality territory. <laughs> okay. My last question was going to be um, how this experience has changed you and I think you gave a little bit of an answer by making you do more of the things you love but also what would you tell people did you maybe realize something about life did you is there any advice you would like to give us yeah um, I you know the only that was the first time I was in the hospital since I was born so, you know, I had a pretty good you know, run there, you know, 65, 66 years never being in the hospital. And I just kind of took my health for granted. And, uh, you know, I realized there's a lot of people who just every day is pain. They have you know, all sorts of you know, medical issues. And it's just hard. And I think it gave me more um, uh, ability to emphasize with, with people who are empathize with people who are um, you know, struggling with that. Um, because when, when I was... You know, at the worst, I was so tired. It was. It took effort to just get up off the couch, you know, walk across the, uh, in the room and, and go to the kitchen and get something to eat. Um, and so it it gave me a, more of a, an appreciation for uh, you know, what a blessing it is to have good health. And then it also um, uh, made me realize that you no, know, each day is a gift because you know, we have no guarantees. Uh, you know, stuff happens, you know, people get killed in auto accidents, they get cancer, uh, you know, wars break out. So we should, um, you know, it sounds cliche, but you should live each day, you know, fully. And that doesn't mean just for pleasure, but, you know, live it for what really matters. Uh, because in the long run, you know, in, in, in light of eternity, there's a lot of things that we do that are so trivial and don't mean much. So I'd rather give my life to what's, what's really important. And what's really important? Well, um, you know, knowing God uh, and then loving people the way he loves them. So, so trying to love people the way he loves them. So you know, give, giving ourselves to, to others and, and trying to live uh, a life in, in line with how God designed life to be lived. Mm-hmm. Professor, I want to thank you deeply for this wonderful conversation. It was lovely to have you. Well, thank uh, you for inviting me. Um, is there anything else you would like to say that I haven't asked you? Any last words? No. Uh, oh, no. Oh, 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 last words. Uh, no. <laughs> for, for just words. You know, these are my last words. No, uh, no. <laughs> for the podcast. For no, the podcast. No, I'm, I think you've, you've done a good job of uh, hopefully letting your listeners know a little bit about me. And uh, anyone listening that wants to just stop by my office, and I, I always love having students stop by, so just you know, stop by and say hi, and you know, we can talk. And then you can both go out of that room with something valuable. I hope so, yeah. Thank you, and listeners, we will see you. Me and Lubo, our new host, will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.